afternoon, everybody. My name is Melanie Morris. I'm one of the uh, colorectal surgeons within the Division of GI Surgery. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Greg Kennedy for putting together this conference. I think it's great, um, and we're happy to see so many faces here. Look forward to talking to you this afternoon about diverticulitis. So I'm just going to give you a very brief background and then talk about both uncomplicated and complicated diverticulitis, so a few technical considerations, and then I'm going to just go over two difficult cases very briefly. Um, so as most of you know, the risk of developing diverticular disease in the United States increases with age. So only about 5% of people have diverticulosis by age 40, but about 80% by age 80. 10 to 20% of these patients will develop diverticulitis. Of those, 10 to 20% will require hospitalization, and of those, 20 to 50% will actually require an operation. So with diverticulitis, initially you're going to do a history and physical. You're going to look for left lower quadrant tenderness, fever, and leukocytosis. If, if the symptoms are concerning enough, you may choose to get a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, um, which may show colon wall thickening, fat stranding, a phlegmon, extraluminal gas, abscess, stricture, or fistula. Um, when patients resolve their episode of diverticulitis, you ne need to make sure that they've either had a recent colonoscopy or that they get one at least about six or eight weeks after resolution of their symptoms to confirm the diagnosis. So how do we treat acute non-complicated diverticulitis? Well, oral or IV antibiotics are, have been the standard of care, um, and that's still the current recommendations from all the societies. Although there is some data that suggests that maybe these patients don't need antibiotics. In Sweden, there was actually a randomized controlled clinical trial at 10 hospitals that had 632 patients. So 314 they treated with antibiotics and 309 without. You'll see the results here. So when you look at abdominal pain, temperature, and abdominal tenderness during their hospital course, there was no difference in patients who got antibiotics and those who didn't. Well, so maybe antibiotics prevent complicated diverticulitis. Well, they looked at that question, too. And in the patients who got antibiotics, three had complicated diverticulitis, and six had, who did not receive any antibiotics had complicated diverticulitis. This was not st statistically significantly different. Well, but it's going to accelerate their recovery. They're going to get better quicker with the antibiotics. Well, this study actually doesn't support that either. So the length of stay was the same, about 2.9 days in both the patients who did and did not receive antibiotics. Well, but then it'll prevent recurrences if I give antibiotics. Well, actually, this study does not support that either. So the recurrence rates were the same, 15 and 16 percent in both groups. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't give antibiotics to patients because, again, all, we need more studies to sort of confirm this, but there is some thought that maybe this is a primary inflammatory process rather than an infectious one. So what about a patient who's had acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis? What should I do with them? Well, the recurrence rates in these patients are about 13 to 23 percent, and we know that there are low rates of complicated disease after the first episode of acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis. After the first uncompl uh, uncomplicated attack, the risk of emergency surgery with a stoma is only one in 2,000 patient years of follow-up. So the days of when we told our patients, oh my goodness, you had an episode of diverticulitis, you need surgery so you don't get a bag, the, the data actually don't support that. We've also learned that the number of attacks does not predict the severity of future attacks. So the days that we were taught three episodes of diverticulitis and your colon comes out, the data actually don't support that either. And we know that complicated diverticulitis is most likely to happen on the first attack. So I'm going to go over a few of the ASCRS practice parameter guidelines. They do a thorough review of the literature uh, routinely with colorectal questions. They recently updated diverticulitis in 2014. And so they recommend the decision for elective sigmoid colectomy after recovery from uncomplicated acute diverticulitis should be individualized. And really, we need to be considering uh, the overall risks of an operation, the patient's medical conditions, their quality of life. Have they used up all their sick time at work? Well, maybe they do need an operation. Do they frequently travel to places where they might not get the same medical care they would here in the United States? Maybe we should consider operating. If you can't do a colonoscopy to exclude malignancy, you should absolutely operate. Um, and then there are these patients we see who have what, what we call smoldering disease. So they get on antibiotics, they feel a little better, they stop the antibiotics, the symptoms come back. If you have a patient that has smoldering disease, they're going to need surgery. So those patients we should think about operating on. 
We don't use age anymore as a decision uh, guide for surgery. And we need to think about patients who are immunosuppressed or transplant patients, and I'll talk about those just a little bit more. So what about complicated diverticulitis? So to sum it up, for acute uncomplicated diverticulitis, it really is a longer clinic appointment and discussion between you and the patient about should you operate or not. They really need to understand the risks of the operation, and we really should have thought hard about the degree of their symptoms. So let's talk about complicated diverticulitis. So as we all know, this is the Hinchy staging with Hinchy 1 being a localized peri pericolic abscess, Hinchy 2 being a large mesenteric abscess, Hinchy 3 is a free perforation with purulent peritonitis, and Hinchy 4 is feculent peritonitis. I personally do not like the Hinchy system. I don't know what your experiences have been, but I rarely see patients who have stage three or four disease. Um, most of the patients I see are one or two, or they have free air. What do you do with those patients? They're not discussed in the Hinchy classification. Well, Jim Fleshman and his colleagues actually published this in 2011, which I like this staging better. Um, so their grade one is localized free air uh, without an abscess, so what we would kind of call a microperforation maybe. Um, grade two is a small less than two centimeter collections of distant free air or a small less than four centimeter abscess. Their grade three is a larger collections of distant free air or larger greater than four centimeter abscess. And then grade four is the same with feculent peritonitis, which again I think is quite rare. This paper also has some nice treatment algorithms um, that I, I like as well. So if you have a patient that has um, free an abscess or free intraperitoneal, obviously every unstable patient just needs to go to the operating room for exploration and definitive management. Um, if you have a patient that has stable vitals, you should get a CT scan, but their symptoms are concerning enough for admission, you should get a CT scan. If they have a grade one through three, according to this classification, you can actually watch these patients. So as long, so even if they have distant free air, they don't necessarily need an operation. Um, and if you have a grade four perforation, those patients are very sick, as we know, and they need an operation. So you have these patients that have a little bit of free air, and they may have a localized abscess. What are you, what are you going to do with those patients? Well, if the abscess is greater than four centimeters, we really need to work hard to drain those abscesses. If it's less than four centimeters, um, or your interventional radiologist says they can't get to it and drain it, um, it's okay to place these patients on broad-spectrum antibiotics with bowel rest. May, they may need TPN if they're malnourished. Um, and then watch them for 48 hours and see. If they improve, consider getting a follow-up CT scan. If they don't improve, then get a, you may get another CT scan to see if things have progressed, um, and maybe now you have an abscess that can be drained or the, or the situation's more concerning. And if they're not getting better, they need an operation. So what do the ASCRS practice parameters say about this? Well, they say elective colectomy should typically be considered after the patient recovers from an episode of complicated diverticulitis. Um, and complications, as we know, include free perforation, abscess, fistula, obstruction, or stricture. Um, things like strictures or fistulas, colovesical, colovaginal, those patients definitely need an operation. There's certainly some movement towards if you had a small abscess that was drained, maybe you don't need your sigmoid colon out. But our society doesn't go so far as recommending that yet. Um, if a patient just has a phlegmon or a small amount of extraluminal gas, one of those micro perforations, they may not need an operation. In, in these patients, um, expectant management is reported for patients with smaller abscesses, but the recurrence rates may be as high as 40%. So again, you really need to go over these things with your patients and make a decision together. So emergency surgery for acute um, diverticulitis. So Urgent sigmoid colectomy is required for patients with diffuse peritonitis, those stage three and four, Hinchy, or stage four with the Fleshman criteria, or in those in whom non-operative management of acute diverticulitis fails. You also need to consider operating, and maybe sooner rather than later, in patients who are developing an ileus or bowel obstruction symptoms with their diverticulitis. They typically don't get better without an operation. And in patients who have the persistent pain or inability to tolerate oral. So following resection, the decision to restore bowel continuity must incorporate patient factors, intraoperative factors, and surgeon preference. So you're in the operating room, and which operation are you going to choose? Um, some patients still do need a Hartman's procedure performed, but again, those are going to be the ones who are unstable and very sick. 
uh, there's more of a movement towards performing an anastomosis um, with or without a diverting loop ileostomy. The things to consider are hemodynamic stability, uh, acute organ failure, immunosuppression, comorbidities, the overall health of the tissue, uh, and the locations of the abscesses. So a couple of technical considerations. The extent of your resection should include the sigmoid colon with healthy margins, both on the descending colon and the rectum. The risk of recurrence for surgery for diverticulitis, the risk of recurrent diverticulitis is increased with a colocolonic anastomosis as opposed to a colorectal anastomosis. Um, you should not be using the inflamed tissue in your anastomosis. You obviously have a higher risk of anastomotic leak. You do not need to move all the diverticula, and a leak test should be performed on all colorectal anastomoses. I'm briefly going to go over two, um, two, ca two cases that I learned a lot from taking care of both of these patients. The first is a 67-year-old woman who had end-stage renal disease, secondary to polycystic kidney disease, and had a renal transplant in 1993. She was sent to my clinic after one prior episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis, um, and it had and she was treated successfully then. Um, she then was transferred back to our hospital. So I told her she didn't need an operation. You've had one attack of diverticulitis, you don't need an operation. Then one year later, she gets transferred back to our hospital with abdominal pain, fever, and a CT scan that shows this. So obviously fluid around the sigmoid colon, you can see the transplanted kidney um, in the pelvis and signs of diverticulitis. So we... Um, we initially underwent percutaneous drainage of this fluid collection and treated her with IV antibiotics. Um, we scanned her six days later, um, and she was clinically deteriorating. She had increased abdominal pain, increased tachycardia, and had failed to improve. So she was taken emergently to the operating room and had to have a Hartman's procedure performed um, because she was becoming unstable. She um, did get a post-op colonoscopy. We did do a, a colostomy closure on her, and she recovered well. I think the lessons learned from that, patients who are immunosuppressed, we really need to treat differently. And there's not a lot of good data on them, but I would support an early operation even after one episode of diverticulitis in those patients. This is another patient that I treated this last year, a 46-year-old woman. She recently had thoracic outlet syndrome surgery, and this was a revisional surgery at a different institution. She was on a lot of narcotics from this operation. She presented with constipation, abdominal pain. She was tachycardic, as you can see. Her white blood cell count was 29,000. She was tender to palpation in the lower abdomen and had some focal peritonitis in the left lower quadrant. The residents told me she had to go to the operating room right now. We got a CT scan of her uh, abdomen and pelvis, and I just put some selected cuts on here, and you can see she had, she had a significant amount of air, but it was all extra peritoneal. There was no free intraperitoneal air. She had no free fluid in the pelvis, but she did have this extra peritoneal air. We treated her with IV fluids, IV antibiotics, bowel rest. We watched her very closely. Her exam improved. She was discharged on hospital day seven. She had a follow-up colonoscopy that was consistent with diverticulosis. And this was back in March of, of this last year. She's doing well and no recurrences that I know of. So again, I think you know, we're sort of taught that extra luminal air means an operation. But in diverticulitis, I, have to, I think we have to think about that. You have to treat the overall patient you have to be very um, thoughtful. She was a young, otherwise healthy woman. We kept a very close eye on her, um, but the initial plan had been, as per the residents, a Hartman's procedure. So we saved this woman with having a colostomy, and she was successfully treated non-operatively.